Okay. Um, so I think we're a couple minutes ahead of schedule, but I'm nervous that I'm not going to get to finish everything in time. So maybe I'll start now and that will give a little bit more time for questions um, if they come up. So, um, okay, great. So I'm um, uh, Matt Weinberg and I'm going to focus this talk specifically on the design of cryptocurrencies. So some of the talks and I, I think the panel discussion later will focus on questions like what can you do with the cryptocurrency, but I'm specifically going to focus on designing them. And I'm also going to focus on incentive challenges in designing them. Okay. So, okay. So um, also, especially on the first few slides, feel free to ask lots of questions because I think if the ideas in the first few slides are not clear, it will make the later slides harder. Okay. So just to recap, this was covered at the end of Alex's talk. Um, there are some problems that are already kind of solved by existing cryptography, okay? So like he said, you can't just forge transactions. Digital signatures prevent you from doing that. You can't retroactively change contents of a block, and that's because the hash will change. That will break the hash pointers, and everyone will know that you tried to change the contents of an old block, and everything will be recognized as invalid. Okay, and also I can't permanently block a transaction from entering the chain because someone, some other miner later might decide to include it. Okay, so this is what you can't do and this is what, uh, basically all these problems are solved by modern cryptography. Okay, yeah. I didn't have time to ask that. Uh, yeah. Could you like, have you created that two um, users that make transactions to each other just to fill a block so you can mine a block? Good, yeah, okay, so the question was, could I create two accounts and just flood the network with a bunch of transactions paying each other? So yes, you could do that. However, what, so here's what would happen. So remember that you're allowed to include a fee to be included in a block. So likely what that would cause is other people who have real transactions that want to get in, they would start paying a little bit more to get in. And now your transactions, if you still want to flood the network and take up all of this block space, then you would have to start paying a fee and it would actually cost you something to do this. But you could, so think of it as just like um, space in a block is a resource and you have the option to pay for it. So if you want to use it for a silly purpose, you will have to start paying for it, but you could choose to do that if you want. If you are the miner, you can use it to pump, to pump up the, uh, the price. You could also try to do that. Yeah, if you're a miner, you might try to, like if you're mining lots of blocks, you may have an incentive to do this to try and bump up the fees that everyone else is paying and maybe you'll make money even though you still have to pay fees when your transactions are included in blocks. But you could do this. If you're a miner, you can always pay zero fee and I, I, I can't hear anything up here. You say if you're a miner, you can always like, pay zero fee and include it yourself. But that's, that's, maybe that's an extent to which you can bump up the price if you always do your That's thing. also true. You can also just have a block that's empty. Hmm? Okay. Yes, yes. Oh, sorry, that was your present. Yes, you can make a block that's empty. That's fine. As long as, as long as it points to a valid block and everything is valid, you don't need to include any transactions. Actually, initially, all of the blocks, for the most part, in any cryptocurrency, are going to be empty before it actually starts being used, right? Because nobody's done that. Like, there's not enough. Bitcoins, we move that up. Um, so in, in the extreme case, think of the very first block. Nobody owned any cryptocurrency until the first block was mined. So, yeah. Sorry, I miss, sorry, I misunderstood what you're asking. So, regarding permanently blocking a transaction, if you are in the lowest state of the quantile in terms of magnitude of the transaction, you would naturally get some sort of thing. If because you are, yes. Because the principle would be if you the value of the transaction is smaller, the fees you would pay for the smaller right. the price. So, yeah, so that, I think um, Jacob is going to touch on that a little bit in his talk about like what fees will look like. Um, so it's, yeah, so, but that is true if you are not paying, if, if you're in the lowest quantile of fees and block is filling up with higher fees, then you're not going to get included. That's right. But if, if, there's, if there's enough space to include everyone who wants to be included, then you can probably get in with a minimal fee. And that's, I think, roughly the current state. Yes. Is that right? Yeah, there is a huge amount of data. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, it's all public. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, then just to point out basically the kinds of deviations that I'm going to focus on in this talk, the theme is that basically, if you look at these, you will immediately, like, 
you will just see there's no way that a clever use of cryptography is possibly going to fix these problems. Okay, right? So one thing you can do, like Alex said, when I'm mining, I don't have to point to the longest chain. I can point to whatever block I want to, and cryptography is not going to fix that. Also, as soon as I find a block, again, I don't have to broadcast it immediately. I can broadcast it whenever I want. And I can also include any set of transactions I want. I don't have to follow a rule that says include as much as I can or include the highest fee transactions. I can do whatever I want in terms of this. Okay, and cryptography is not going to be able to force people to follow certain rules. Okay, um, and then also, so, um, so I have, uh, again, like I said, lots of stuff to cover. I'm happy to not cover stuff I intended to. If there are questions a little bit unrelated, that's fine. Um, so definitely feel free to ask. Um, the other thing I want to quickly disclaim is that I'm going to cite you know, some related papers throughout the talk. My knowledge of literature is heavily biased. It's an enormous literature, and I know like a very small subset. So I'm trying my best to be representative of the areas I'm covering, but I'm sure I'm going to miss stuff when I do that. OK, so what am I going to do um, in this talk? So I'm going to try to be pretty broad in what I cover. So I hope I'm going to cover, I think, five different topics. So it's less, much less than 10 minutes per topic. But hopefully, I will give you some intuition for what are the challenges in that topic and a very brief idea of what is existing work already trying to address it. OK? Um, so the first half, I'm going to cover three topics of challenges already in just the core Bitcoin um, proof of work model. So this is exactly the model that Alex covered in his talk. And then um, in the second half, I'm going to cover these, um, actually Alex mentioned these two at the end of his talks, two um, more novel ideas that are uh, deviating from uh, the Bitcoin protocol that Alex described. Okay. So the first thing I want to do is abstract away a lot of the details that came up in Alex's talk and just make like a, a much simpler game to really focus only on the mining aspect and the rewards. Okay, and so this was um, posed in a paper that was actually in EC uh, two years ago. Okay, so think of the following game. So there's a set of miners. Every miner has some computational power. We'll think of it as a distribution, so the power is sum to one. At all times, every miner is going to be aware of some directed tree. So think of this as the set of blocks that they're aware of, and they all point to something previous. They all have the same root, which is this original block where the currency started. Okay, and what you should try to imagine, like in the picture Alex drew, the nodes in the tree are blocks and the directed edge pointing eventually towards the root, that's the previous block that you're pointing to. Okay, so what does the game look like? So every time step, a random miner is selected to produce a block proportional to their mining power. And so what does it mean to create a block? You create a new node and you can add a directed edge to any single node in the graph of stuff you're aware of. Okay, so again, you don't have to follow the longest chain. You can point wherever you want, as long as you're aware of the block. Also, every time step, every miner can broadcast any of the nodes that they're aware of to the rest of the network. So in this simple model, we're not going to focus on latency and having some uh, miners hear about it while others don't, or some miners hear about it faster. We'll just say when you broadcast, every other node becomes aware of, uh, every other player becomes aware of these nodes. Okay, and so the point is this is trying to capture, you can choose anywhere you want to mine, but you have to have heard about the node in order to mine there. Okay, and this last part uh, is just to make things a little bit formal so the game is finite. So we'll say that um, uh, once there has um, been a node that has been broadcast to everyone, that is a distance t from the root, then we'll say that the game stops. Okay, so this part is not really significant to the reasoning. That's just to make it formal. And what is the payoff going to be? So um, when V is the unique node of depth T that causes the game to stop, then we're going to look at what is the path from V to the root. We'll say this was the longest chain when the game stopped. And everyone along this path gets a payoff 1 over T. And let's think of T as going all the way to infinity. Okay. So, um, so this is the game. This is the model I want you to have in mind. So I've abstracted mining away to just having a random node selected and just picking a, a other node to point to. Um, so again, feel free to ask questions about like why this captures Bitcoin mining or something like that before we move on. Um, while maybe you're thinking of questions or maybe everything's okay, I just want to point out one sanity check is that in this game, 
you are trying to maximize your fraction of nodes on the longest chain. So think there is this finite, uh, there's this finite number of T nodes that get to be on the longest chain that receive payoff at the end. And you are trying to maximize the number of those T nodes that were created by you. Okay? And so this means that in this game, it is good for you to cause other nodes that are created to not be on the longest chain. Because if nodes that are created by other people are not on the longest chain, they don't take up this valuable space that you can have to have, uh, create instead. And what I want to quickly claim is that this maps onto reality because of Bitcoin's difficulty adjustment. Okay, so the idea is that you are not just trying to make, um, sorry, another way to phrase it is that the uh, growth, the longest chain grows proportional to time. So because of this difficulty adjustment, every two, every two weeks there are 2016 blocks and so the length of the longest chain, because of the difficulty adjustment, is going to be proportional to time. So the fraction of blocks that you have on the longest chain really captures the number of blocks per unit time that you are creating. So it captures your revenue per time instead of just absolute revenue without normalizing. Okay, so are there any questions, quick questions about like why this game captures um, mining or, yeah. Okay, so, so one way this is different is that like a miner who really mines a block gets the reward and it can sell immediately. Say that again. So a miner who really mines a block gets the reward and then can sell it immediately on an exchange or whatever, instead of having to wait at every two weeks that only in hindsight do the people who mine the longest blocks get the reward. Right? That's correct. Yes, that's yeah, correct. So, so I'm abstracting. Yes, yeah, so I'm abstracting away the fact that technically you would have to wait two weeks for the difficulty to adjust. That's correct. Yeah. Is there, I, I didn't understand the difficulty adjustment. How, how is this different? Like, how, how do you want to define the reward like infinitely often? the reward is not distributed at the end of time. It's like. That's correct. Yeah, so um, so what I'm trying to capture is more like a steady state reward. So what I want to claim is that if you are doing well in this game as T goes to infinity, then it's because you are making in steady state, you're making a lot of money per unit time. So in this game, in this game, the rewards are all being paid off at the end, but that's just formal because technically at the intermediate <coughs> stages, I don't know what the longest chain is. So, so really, I would say it's a simplifying assumption so that, so that I don't have to stress about being making payoff because you're currently on the longest chain, and then later you lose that payoff because you're no longer on the longest chain, and worrying about what the longest chain is. So it's a simplifying assumption, but it's supposed to capture rewards over time. But like the, the blockchain definition, like you chop off the last couple of blocks, the previous should have stabilized, except with the probability. Say that again. Sorry, it's, there's like a really loud fan. Oh, I'm just saying like the, you can strengthen the definition because like every time you chop off the last couple of blocks, like the, the prefix of the chain is stable except with like you could also do that. Yes, that's correct. So, so you also could, yeah, so I think what the suggestion is, you could just repeat this game also, uh, you know, also a thousand times and say that every time the game, every time the epic stops, then that is fixed and then continue repeating. You could do that too if you wanted to better capture the rewards over time. I think like the idea basically is that as T approaches infinity, the percentage of the chain that stabilized approaches 100%. So like all of that stuff involving the like, involving machine being unstable in reality becomes negligible. Yes, that's also true. I think my question was really that I don't understand why in the real world you might benefit from excluding some other block. That yeah. So so think like say that you can't control the total mining power in the world. So you can't control that. A block is, um, sorry, that maybe people are computing uh, 2 to the 70 hashes per 10 minutes. That's, that's set. What you can't control is the difficulty that you need to create a block. So if all of those blocks are making it onto the longest chain, then you need to do 2 to the 70 hashes in order to make a block on the longest chain. If you can make half of them not be on the longest chain, that now only two to the 69 are actually contributing to the longest chain, and the difficulty adjustment will make it easier. Now you only need to do two to the 69 hashes to do it, and so your fixed unit of computational power is going to make blocks on the longest chain faster because the difficulty is going to lower. Does that? The difficulty is what's the hash threshold that you need to compute, and that adjusts so you'll get the blocks every constant amount of time average. 
So the hash has to be like say less than 10 to the 17 if it does this amount of minus. If you double the minus number of minus, we need to make it twice as hard, so you still get a block every 10 minutes on that system. Are you counting the fraction of my blocks are the absolute count? Are you, are you counting the fraction, like the fraction of all blocks as time approaches t, or the, no. the absolute count of the count of the blocks? You only get uh, no. You only get credit for the ones on the longest chain. Yeah, the longest. Are, are you like uh, are you using the relative count, like the the fraction of the total number of blocks? On yeah. The so I'm trying. So basically, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to normalize by time. So I'm trying to capture how much reward are you getting every ten minutes. In terms of the fraction of the blocks. I'm basically, I'm, I'm just dividing by 10 minutes, basically. By dividing by T, I'm saying how much reward do you get every 10 minutes. What is divided by T? T is the length of the chain. Yeah. So think like how many 10 minute intervals have passed. I'm saying if you created 10 blocks in 100 minutes, then I want to say that uh, you've created one tenth of a block every 10 minutes. One block every, sorry, yeah. So is the strategy space deciding when to broadcast a block? Uh, and deciding where to mine, and and where right? So every time you make a choice, that's your strategy space. So it's space. both what you're mining Correct. on and when you host. Correct. And, 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 and like, you know, that is Correct. all of the strategy space. That is correct, yeah. So it's capturing a very simple aspect of mining. The whole point is that if this is interesting, probably, you know, there are richer strategies. Okay, let me, um, continue now. So um, just because I'm going to use a little bit of this language to make it easier to describe strategies later, let me say what is longest chain in this language. So right. So, um, like was pointed out, there's two choices you have to make. So the first one is whenever you're selected to build a block, point to the furthest node from the root in what you've heard about and break ties in favor of the first node that you heard about. If there's still a tie, do it randomly. And always broadcast every time you're allowed to broadcast, broadcast everything that you've heard of. Okay. Um, so my understanding is that uh, prior to the work I'm about to describe, um, so there is um, intuition in uh, Nakamoto's original white paper, and it was largely accepted um, before this paper, that if all other miners are following the longest chain protocol, and you have less than 50% of the computational power in the network, then it is your best response to follow the longest chain protocol as well. Okay, so this is, I, don't, I don't think claims like this were formally made, but largely this was the intuition. Okay, so why was this the intuition? Well, this is true for a specific kind of attack. Okay, so one thing I might try to do, I might try to just say, forget about everyone else, I'm just gonna make my own chain. Okay, and if you're comfortable with basic probability, if I try to make my own chain with less than 50% of the power of everyone else, then their chain is gonna grow faster than mine, and with probability zero, I'm ever going to make anything in the longest chain. Okay, and in Nakamoto's white paper, he actually does a, also a correct random walk analysis to understand like, you know, okay, what if you have 49.9% .9 of the power, how much, you know, what's the probability and stuff like this. Um, but the point is it um, is one specific attack. It doesn't consider all the different deviations you might make. Okay, so the um, first thing I wanna discuss is um, this uh, result from a Yalan Sierra, which showed that if you have at least a third of the computational power, then following the longest chain protocol is actually not the best response to everyone else following the longest chain <coughs> protocol in this stylized model. Okay, and so this is um, referred to as a selfish mining attack. And so let me, um, I'm not going to even describe the entire attack, but I will give you intuition for why the attack works. Okay, so imagine the following ideal world that I'm going to tweak the longest chain protocol that everyone else is using. I'll call it lucky longest chain because basically you, the attacker, are going to be very lucky and every time there is a tie, the ties are gonna get broken in your favor, okay? So what everyone else is gonna do, whenever they are selected to build a block, they are still gonna follow longest chain, but if there's a tie, they are always gonna break the ties in favor of you, okay? So it's not gonna be random, it's not gonna be what they heard about first, it's always gonna be for you, okay? And they will also always broadcast. Okay, now the observation is that you, as a potential attacker, you, you have no pressure to announce your blocks quickly when you find them, right? So everyone else is broadcasting immediately as they find, and everyone is tie-breaking in favor of you. So what you can do is if you find a block that is distance D from the root, and there is no other block you've heard about that is distance D from the root, you can just wait, that's fine. 
And you can wait until someone else announces a block, distance d from the root, and then you announce yours. Now what's going to happen when you do this? You're going to win the tiebreaker because that's what everyone else is doing. And it's also going to cause um, this other block to not be in the longest chain when this happens. Okay? And you can actually show, so this is actually the best response to all other miners using this lucky longest chain. So if you win every tiebreaker, this is the best thing you can do. And your reward is going to be x over 1 minus x if you have an x fraction of the mining power. Okay? If instead you were using the longest chain protocol, you would only get x. Okay? And so what I just said out loud is actually basically intuition for the entire proof of this, which is that every time you mine a block, it is definitely getting in the longest chain. And you're also kicking something out that someone else created from the longest chain. So in total, there's only one minus x blocks being put on the longest chain, and you're creating an x fraction of them. Okay, so this model is unrealistic, right? Because you, know, you should not expect to get so lucky um, on every tiebreaker. But the point is that using similar ideas to this, and again, I don't want to get into all the details. It's, it's not that complicated, but I would rather spend the time being broad than diving into this. Um, so there is uh, using the same ideas. Um, even if you lose every single tiebreaker, so even if you have no luck with the randomness, if you have at least a third of the total computational power, there is something better you can do um, in response to everyone else using longest chain. Okay, so after this, there were some nice um, uh, follow-up work. So this is um, Saperstein et al. and uh, Kiyayas et al. that show that, if, however, if it's the case that you lose every single tiebreaker and you have less than, um, it's a long decimal that's about 30% of the total mining power, then actually using longest chain itself is a best response to everyone else using longest chain. Okay, so one thing that's nice about this, it does at least confirm some of the intuition that was around before, which is that, okay, maybe 50% isn't the right number, but you do need to have a lot of mining power in order to do something more clever than longest chain in response to everyone else using longest chain. Okay, so what, um, what, would, what do I think is kind of like the main point of this research direction. So my impression is that the Bitcoin community is convinced that the protocol is incentive compatible in practice. And this seems like the kind of question that the AGT community could form an opinion on too. And uh, there are some people who value our opinion. And we should, this is exactly the kind of thing, if we're going to contribute to mechanism design for cryptocurrencies, this is the kind of thing we should have an opinion on. Okay. Um, so here's a, uh, so, okay, so also throughout the talk, I'm just going to try and plant some sample open directions. I'm not trying to claim this is like an exhaustive list of good things to work on. Um, but one thing that at least I find curious is that um, the current theory that I just presented seems to suggest that selfish mining would be profitable for some miners on many different cryptocurrencies. So not necessarily Bitcoin, but there are many cryptocurrencies where it would be profitable. It has been detected on some cryptocurrencies, but it hasn't been detected, I think, at quite the rate that this simple theory would predict. Um, so I think an interesting question is just to understand what exactly is the theory missing, and whatever it's missing, can it be updated so that we can understand when is a cryptocurrency vulnerable or not vulnerable to attacks like this? Okay, so like I said, my plan now is to just jump topics to something else. And again, the hope is that you will understand a little intuition behind each of these challenges and a little bit about what's already done, but um, maybe avoiding deep discussions. But yeah. So your question, how do you even detect such a attack? Good, so the idea is, so let's think about the specific one that I told you. So in this simple model, you would observe that there is an odd number of blocks being released at the same physical time. Right? You would say, you know, um, maybe you have some, right? So if, if blocks are produced every 10 minutes and it takes 10 seconds for them to be transmitted throughout the network, you would expect if everyone is behaving, some number of uh, conflicts. If instead there's some miner where every time they mine a block there's a conflict, you would, you would, immediate, you would be able to statistically realize that, okay, something is happening to cause this conflict. It's not, it's not, nat it's not happening naturally. You could not necessarily find the specific miner and punish them because they could be making thousands of different accounts and it's a different public key every time they do this attack, but you could detect that someone is doing something to cause more conflicts than normal. Okay, um, so now I'm gonna shift gears and talk about the difference between transaction fees and the block reward. Um, so as Scott mentioned in Alex's talk, so currently in Bitcoin, the transaction fees are quite low 
So they are non-zero, but they account for a very small fraction of the rewards that you get from creating a block. So what this means is that while there is variance in the rewards that you get via transaction fees, it's not very significant. You still get roughly 12 and a half Bitcoin for every block that you create. Okay, however, every four years, the block reward is gonna have, okay? So I think uh, we're two years away from the next one. And the hope or the expectation is that transaction fees will take over. So what this means is that the same variance that we already see today is just gonna now mean the difference between getting 12 and a half versus uh, two Bitcoin for creating a block. Okay, and so there is a uh, pretty hotly debated topic on the best way to ensure that transaction fees rise and are stable. If you heard kind of in you know the uh, pop news, there was this block size debate, and this is related to that, but it's also about more than just transaction fees. And um, however, despite this debate, the following intuition I think was you know again uh, in Nakamoto's white paper, and I think largely um, around, which said that if you are able to get the transaction fees to rise and be stable, and the miners are risk neutral, then there's not a huge difference between whether a block is worth 12 and a half deterministically or 12 and a half in expectation, okay? And there's some good intuition for this, which is that if you are using the same strategies in the transaction fees model as you were in the block reward model and miners are risk neutral, then all of your payoffs for all of the same strategies are the same because 12 and a half in expectation to a risk neutral minor is the same thing as 12 and a half deterministically. Okay, um, and what I wanna give you intuition for on the next couple slides is that um, this is not accurate and that incentive issues are much more complex in a couple different ways um, when you're in the transaction fee model instead of the block reward model. Okay, so one that I'm not gonna have time to explain is that selfish mining actually becomes profitable no matter how much computational power you have. And you also run into this issue where miners may intentionally try to undercut each other in order to steal high value transaction fees. Okay, and the intuition is again, not that all of a sudden miners care about the difference between 12 and a half in expectation and 12 and a half deterministically. It's that you now have a much richer strategy space. So now when I'm deciding, for instance, whether or not to withhold a block for selfish mining, I can say, I can look at it and figure out like, well, how much is this block worth? And it's gonna be worth something different because the transaction fees are more variable. Is it because they're not chaotic? Are there any sorts of um, It is not even necessarily because they're not myopic. So for selfish mining, you need to be non-myopic. For the undercutting, even if you're myopic, you may want, you, you may want to try and undercut. Yeah. Okay, so, so the idea, again, the idea is that the strategy space is richer. Some blocks are gonna be worth less and you may want to treat them differently than blocks that are worth more. And this enables strategies that didn't make sense in the block reward model. Okay, so I'm just, again, gonna try and give you some quick intuition for what might go wrong. So um, let's again look at the longest chain protocol and see what the longest chain protocol asks you to do in this situation. So what does this picture mean? It means that uh, this block was created at some point and there was a natural fork and one of them had uh, 15 transaction fees inside, one of them had 10 transaction fees inside. And so from the same pool of possible remaining transactions, if there were 20 left after this block, Five of them are still left to build on top of here and 10 of them are still left to build on top of here. Okay, and so let's say that you heard about uh, block A first, then what the longest chain protocol asks you to do is to break ties in favor of A and to create this block that has uh, five transaction fees in it. Okay, so maybe this seems like a silly thing to do and what you might do instead is barely deviate from the intended protocol. You are still gonna follow the longest chain you're just gonna say, you know what, as long as I'm tie-breaking, let me tie-break in a way that let me claim, lets me claim uh, more fees. Okay, so what you might do instead is still mine on top of a longest chain. So this 10 is still a longest chain, but you are now going to get uh, uh, 10 instead of five for your transaction fees. Okay, so this alone does not seem like a big deal, right? It's still following the longest chain. The tie-breaking is a little bit different and the tie-breaking was not an essential part of the original protocol in the first place. But if you think a little bit ahead, the problem then becomes, what if you are an attacker and you know that other people in the network are tie-breaking in this specific way? So now let's say you are in this situation. So there wasn't a natural fork that created this block down here, but uh, you are looking at exactly this state. And what you can do is follow the longest chain protocol. There's a unique longest chain, which asks you to make a block that's worth five on top of the 15. And what you could do instead is basically cause this situation 
that forces the next miner to tie break in this different way. Right? So you could be the one who takes 10 of these fees and makes a block immediately on top of the seven. And now the next miner is in exactly the situation we saw. Okay, so it is important to reason about what the next miner could do. Maybe they insist on being loyal to the protocol or the default client and they will tie break randomly. In that case, this is a dumb idea because you're just creating a block that no one is gonna follow. But if the next miner does choose to tie break in this way, then you would get 10 instead of five and it would be a good idea. Okay, so again, this was all just to give intuition for why transaction fees are harder to reason about than the block reward. I'm gonna summarize and immediately move on. Okay, so this was just one of the complications, this undercutting, and uh, Jacob's gonna talk um, in his talk about how, you know, this issue of how transaction fees are gonna rise and become stable in the first place. There's another issue that I guess I don't wanna get into, which is even um, how do you guarantee that everyone in the network is going to hear about the transactions, okay? Because the idea you're relying on the, uh, again, currently the benevolence of the miners broadcasting everything, when now these fees are gonna be worth something. Um, and maybe, sorry, the last thing I wanna point out is that there are actually good ideas that I think would resolve a lot of these problems that are discussed, or I think informally in the community. Um, as far as I'm aware, I don't think that these ideas that seem really good to me are being implemented in the uh, major currencies. Um, and I'm not sure why. So I don't know, so I would say similar to before, I don't know exactly what the theory is missing, but the, you know, I would say my intuition is that these would be good protocol, good modifications to uh, protocols in order to advance against these attacks. Yeah. Well, you can say immediately why the second one doesn't work. And the reason basically is that if you have a protocol where, like basically the, the, the proposer of a block is the one that has like, monopoly power to decide which transactions to include, right? So if inside the protocol, the, the proposer can only internalize 1% of the games, then you have the incentive to basically have extra protocol payment mechanisms, and then the proposer will just accept two transactions with a very minimum fees, and you have a very complex games outside. Okay, so, so if I understand correctly, the suggestion is that this is actually very hard to technically enforce that even if you try to enforce this in the original protocol, you could find ways around it. Yeah. Well, to enforce it, you need a mandatory fee. Yeah, basically, the, 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 the one trick that we have come up with is that if you specify a sub-minimum fee level, then like the, the fees that, the, the portion of the fees that is the minimum fee level can be redistributed to other miners, but you can't have a kind of quote marginal tax rate. Yeah. Okay. okay. But if you don't know who's the next final in advance, how do you, how do you contract? Oh, no, the point is that the transaction sender just cannot contract with the proposer of the next block, well, of the next block. And you can do it with smart contracts, right? So you can have a smart contract that basically says, if you include anyone who includes my transaction in a block, we'll get a reward, and that'll be processed on, say, the very classic blockchain. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, okay, so it sounds like the issue is not that it's a bad idea, but that it's actually much harder to implement than I made it sound on this slide. Yeah, okay. Great. So um, the next thing I want to talk about are uh, mining pools. And like Alex mentioned, um, it's uh, often in miners' interest to join mining pools basically because the variance is super high in rewards, right? So imagine that if there's roughly 50,000 blocks a year, and you are a ordinary miner, you are probably making say one or two of those blocks. And so your payout during the year is really highly variable. Okay, so what happens in the mining pool? There's an organizer, they coordinate all the mining and they split the rewards um, whenever a pool finds a block. Let me just give you one, um, one example of how a pool um, might do this. So what the manager does, they give their public key to the participants the participants find a valid block so that it has a very small hash with um, lots of leading zeros. And then what the participants do is they kind of prove to the manager that they're working. So what's gonna happen is that this takes the entire network 10 minutes to find, but if I let you have an additional, um, sorry, if I let you have 20 fewer leading zeros at the front, then this is gonna happen way more frequently than this. And so you can actually get an a roughly accurate count of how hard uh, how much computational power everyone who's in your pool um, has. Okay, and so the manager might maintain shares to keep track of the contribution. They use some reward function to try and figure out what to give. It is tricky to find a good reward function that is incentive compatible. I'm not gonna focus on that. Um, what I do wanna focus on is the interaction between mining pools. Okay, um, so here was some folklore knowledge for a bit. 
um, which is that it might make knowledge, it might make sense to attack a pool to try and make it less desirable to join and recruit its participants. So what might that look like? So maybe I join a pool and every time I find a partial proof, so every time I find a hash that's less than uh, two to the, uh, was it two to the 210, I send it. But whenever I find a real block, one that is actually going to pay, pay out the pool, I just throw it away instead. Okay, so let me, just as a quick sanity check for, um, for people who are new to Bitcoin, what, remember what I cannot do, I cannot be sending the pool manager all of my partial proofs, and then when I find a real block, I just change the ID to pay me instead of the manager. Because as soon as I change the payout, that's gonna change the hash, and it's not gonna uh, have a small hash anymore, so it's no longer gonna pay out. What I can do is I can choose to just throw it away and not let the pool manager know. Okay, so why might I do this? Well, it is going to hurt the other pool in the following sense, that everyone who participates in that pool with X percent of the total mining power, they are not gonna get X percent of the rewards because there's this dead weight in this pool where I'm sucking up rewards, but I'm actually not contributing. Okay, so maybe they'll decide, you know what, this pool sucks, I wanna go join Matt's pool instead. Okay, but it also costs me something because I'm using my, you know, my precious mining power that I could be using to find more blocks, I'm instead using to attack this pool. So it seems like there's a trade-off. Okay, but there's actually um, this uh, nice paper that shows that if you attack with the right proportion, then you can both profit and hurt the other pool. So there's actually no trade-off to using this attack. Okay, so let me give you an example and then I will state uh, exactly when this attack applies. Okay, so in this example, let's say that there's only two pools and they each have 50% of the total mining power. And let's say that pool A, the blue pool, chooses to attack pool B with half of their power, so 25% of the total mining power. Okay, so what's gonna happen? So for pool A's rewards, they are the only contributor to pool A, so pool A gets 100% of pool A's rewards. For pool B, pool B thinks that they are contributing 25% of the total mining power, so that's a third of the total mining power that pool B thinks it has, okay? And so they are gonna get one third of pool B's rewards. Now let's look at where the uh, total rewards are going. So pool A also has 25% of the total mining power that's actually mining. So that's a third of the effective mining power because this other 25% is dead weight. And the other 50%, uh, which turns into two thirds, is for pool B. Okay, and now if we do some quick math, we see that pool A gets 100% of one third plus one third of two thirds, and this is five ninths of the total reward. So they had 50% of the mining power, but they get five ninths of the reward, right? So now they are getting more money. And as this bonus, they are making pool B um, look less efficient than pool A. So they might be able to recruit participants from pool B in addition. Okay, um, so the um, theorem from this paper is that actually, so you know, this example was to give intuition, but actually no matter how many pools there are, no matter the size of you or the size of any of these pools, there, and no matter, even if your own pool manager knows about the attack, you yourself can just do this on your own. Um, this attack is profitable in the sense that the, your best, res best response in this setting is always strictly to attack some other pool. Okay, now, um, however, the gains are pretty minimal on a small scale, so it's roughly quadratic to your own mining power. Okay, so what I wanna point out here is that um, reasoning about interaction between pools is hard. Okay, so first you would have to reason about equilibria in the setting where there's no recruiting and the power of the pools is fixed. And I think this example shows that that is hard to do. Okay, on top of that, you would have to model what is it like to recruit participants and also how does any potential conflict affect value or confidence in the currency and stuff like this. And all of this is uh, difficult. This is again, the kind of thing that maybe um, our community would be good at. Okay, um, the last thing I wanna wrap up with this is that there's a, there's a pro and a con to mining pools. So the con is that with mining pools, there's less decentralization. So currently in Bitcoin, the top three mining pools control more than 50% of the power. And so this has a negative effect on the value of the currency because it's less decentralized. So it's kind of violating the promise of massive decentralization. 
Okay, but there's also some good that mining pools provide, which is that they allow ordinary miners to have lower variance when they mine. So I'm sure there's lots of ordinary miners who would not choose to mine on Bitcoin if there was not the existence of mining pools, because they would have to accept these extremely high variance payoffs, and that might not be um, sustainable for them. Okay, um, so I do want to point out that I'm aware of um, a proposal that would effectively um, make mining pools uh, infeasible by basically forcing you to share a private key among everyone who participates. So here's a short description. If you're comfortable with cryptography, you'll immediately see why it works. If you're not, then you can ask me offline. Um, but the point is that there's something interesting going on with the economics of mining pools in the sense that it does seem to be that the overall community has more value for what mining pools um, bring rather than dislike for the lack of decentralization. Um, because I'm not aware that most of the major cryptocurrencies I don't think have adopted um, this protocol. Okay. The mining pool has an advantage because it provides stability, economic stability to the system. There are the big players who have the incentives to uh, price be fixed. Yeah, so that, okay, so that's another one. The other, the other comment was that having big mining pools involved does provide a sense of economic stability. So that's another thing that I would say is, is again, hard to model, but that would be, like, the point is that um, I think it would be good to understand what is the value of mining pools and how much value do they bring and what settings are they bringing value versus taking away value, something like that. So is that the equilibrium, like, there will only be one pool left in the end? Like, what is the, if everyone performs this, this is the tag? Yeah. So I think for yeah. So I think for for the first models, it would come to my mind. It's hard for me to see how that would not be the conclusion. So I would say that's an instance where it's hard to model. So I haven't seen a formal model. So in practice, it's still decentralized because people maybe care about not. That's right. So the, the I agree. Yeah. So what I would say is that I think I don't know how to write a clean model that captures what you just said. So that's something that I think would be good to do, basically, so that we can understand if we look at a. If we were to look at a new cryptocurrency that hasn't been around for 10 years, how would we be able to quickly understand whether, like, whether it's going to lead to a single mining pool or whether it's going to remain decentralized or something? And but models, good models can help the, with that. The real world mining pools are also not open access, right? Some, most of them are closed. The mining pools? Are they, they're, they're open access to anyone, anyone can jump. The mining pools? Yeah. Yeah, so I would say all, all of that I think would be Basically, all of that I think would be good to model, but that sounds hard to me to model. Like, I'm not immediately thinking of something that would be a good. Uh, there is this work by Aviv Zohar and Lewinberg at all. You can take my mining pools, cooperative game theoretic analysis. Okay. I wonder if you've seen that. It like, basically uses cooperative choice game theory, and their conclusions are that basically, like, there will never be a single mining pool because some people will always be incentivized to switch. Yeah. No. Okay, so I wasn't aware of that. So, so, so now I want to revert to my disclaimer. So I know there's a lot of work out there, and um, I missed this one, and um, maybe that would be a good one to look into for this direction. Yeah. There's, a, there's also interesting um, mining protocols where that, that have mining pools built in, so that if you're participating in a mining pool, you don't know when you found a uh, winning launch. Um, okay, let me... The cryptocurrency itself can be mindful. Also true. Yeah. Okay. So um, let me. Uh, maybe there is no equilibrium. Um, is, is that what you were saying? There's no stable equilibrium. Yeah. Can you look at the IO models of the market power distribution between the entrants? Sorry. Can you look at the. Maybe draw conclusions from IO, which are true, like uh, market share games. Uh, so I also believe that maybe Jacob is going to do that. I'm not going to talk about mining pools, but like what they talked about the Bouzard is looking at the game theory concepts to try to think about that. Um, but there's, there's actually different ways to do this, and it often depends on the details. How can film enter? What happens when film enters? Um, a lot of those things are also called innation devices. So not that it's supposed to think to start a new mining pool, you may be very effective to get all the people to switch over to you, but you need everybody to coordinate on you all of a sudden, and that may be difficult to achieve. Okay. Um, okay, so now, um, okay, so, so I skipped over the summary, um, but basically we saw three, uh, three aspects of the proof of work. I tried to give you some insight for what the challenges are, and some insight for what's already out there. Okay, um, so now the last thing I'm going to be very brief, um, I guess, in talking about um, two remaining challenges. So the first one is uh, proof of stake. Okay, and so maybe you realize kind of through talking through this talk 
that uh, Bitcoin's proof of work is wasting a lot of electricity every year. So one thing I hear thrown around is that it's more electricity than the country of Iceland is being used on Bitcoin mining. Okay, and the main competing proposal that I'm aware of is called proof of stake. And Alex said the main idea there is you still need to pick proportional to something that can't be freely duplicated, but the currency itself can also not be freely duplicated. So that's what proof of stake is. Okay, so let me just give you one potential approach for what proof of stake might look like. Many of the existing proposals don't look um, exactly like this, but this is just something that will help you get the main idea. Okay, so you still try to keep this idea that in order for a block to be valid, you need something to hash very small. What does proof of work look like? Well, a lot of these components you can change. So in particular, one, you could change the contents of the block over and over again to try and change the hash. But what's easier, you can just change this one time pad over and over again to try and make the hash smaller. In proof of stake, what you would like to do is only put stuff in here that can't be freely changed. Okay, so the idea is that if you want to pay yourself, your minor ID is fixed. And if this has to be a coin that is owned by you, then you can't change this you know, within the context of one block because you would need to buy more coins. And you can't change the timestamp, that's just the timestamp. Okay, so the point is that you can have all this computational power you want it's not gonna help you find more blocks. The most number of hashes you want to do is every time step do one hash per coin you own. Any more than that is not helping you find more blocks. So really your ability to find blocks is tied to the coins you own and not to the computational power. Okay, so I wanna highlight quickly two challenges that are different from proof of work in making this work. Okay, so in proof of work, as long as your um, H is a good hash function, the randomness that comes from this one-time pad suffices to get to basically for it to look like real randomness to anyone who's participating. So what do I mean by that? So it first it does select according to the distribution that you would want, but also what's important is that it's unpredictable and independent of previous events. Okay, so in the sense that I don't know who is going to mine the next block because I have no idea who is going to find the best one-time pad uh, faster. Right, so no matter what happened previously, I have no idea who the next miner is gonna be. In proof of stake, it's actually very challenging to replicate this, okay? So let me just use the above proposal as an example, which can be fixed, but um, in the above proposal, what I could do is I can pre-compute all coin time step pairs where I would be eligible to mine if I owned that coin. Okay, so the, it's not going to cause the randomness to not pick proportional to the right distribution. It's just that I will know exactly what's going to happen pretty far in advance. And maybe that will enable me to do some more clever attacks. Okay, so again, this protocol can be modified to not have this specific problem. It causes a different problem that I don't want to get into. Um, but I do want to claim that um, there are formal barriers to using information in the blockchain itself as a source of pseudo randomness for future events in the blockchain. And there are formal attacks you can get from this on a wide class of protocols, okay? I do also wanna be really clear, it doesn't rule out proof of stake, but it does give a class of uh, attacks that do need to be addressed. Okay, the second interesting challenge is what's referred to as nothing at stake. Okay, so here's an observation about proof of work. If there are two chains, and you try to mine, say, off of the longest chain to create a new one, there is an opportunity cost to doing that. Right, so all of that power that you could have spent mining on the longest chain, you are mining somewhere else, and so there's a trade-off. All right, and the point is that it really doesn't make any sense to simultaneously mine on two different chains. Because whatever chain is giving you the highest expected payoff, you should just put all of your mining power on that chain. All right, it makes no sense to try and play both sides. In proof of stake, by definition, there is no opportunity cost to mining on something other than the longest chain. Okay, so that's, that's intended. So what that means is that anytime you are mining, you could simultaneously be mining on as many different chains as you wanted, and there's no cost for doing so. Okay, so this means, I'm just trying to point out, this is a barrier that proof of stake protocols have to figure out how to address. The proof of work protocols do not have to figure out how to address. So that's another reason why they're more challenging. Okay, um, the last thing I wanna say in terms of uh, proof of stake is just briefly summarize the approaches that are out there. So I'm aware of roughly two classes of approaches. The first one I would say looks kind of like longest chain. They're not exactly longest chain, but they're longest chain-ish. And the second I would classify as um, more Byzantine consensus. So there, this is a classical problem in distributed computing, and there are approaches that um, look more like this. Okay, 
the main distinction, I would say, between these two is this concept of finality. Okay, so if you remember the longest chain protocol, the following um, event is possible. So there's a point in time where you believe a transaction to have occurred because it is in the current longest chain and maybe there's six blocks that have come after it and you consider this transaction to have occurred. And then maybe, I don't know, 10 days later, you find out, oh, actually there was a, long, there was a longer chain and it did not contain this transaction, maybe it even contained a different transaction. The longest chain protocol says you should now believe this longer chain and say that this transaction actually didn't occur. Okay, so there's no, there's no finality, although with high probability in practice, things are final. Byzantine consensus is exactly the opposite. So if at any point in time, you believe a transaction to have occurred, it has occurred and it will never not occur after that. So this is not a property of the Byzantine consensus, it's a property of the model. Like Byzantine consensus in the synchronous model also suffers from the same drawback because synchrony makes the assumption that network delay is bounded. And if you ever violate the, that assumption, you, you can break consistency. So there are basically consensus protocols in the synchronous model too, like Algorand has two versions, a, a, a patch yeah, so, version. Yeah, okay, so, so, so the comment is, so yeah, so the comment is I think to prove that a Byzantine consensus protocol has this property, you need to appeal to the model. It's not the case that any Byzantine consensus protocol you come up with in any model is going to have this property, but the goal of a Byzantine consensus protocol is to find a model where you can prove that it has this property. And if you can't prove this, then you don't have a Byzantine consensus. So that's protocol. a different definition of Byzantine consensus. Like, uh, the, the, by the classical distributed systems definition, you can define Byzantine consensus in a synchronous model too, where the network delay has to be bounded and not to be pulled down. So those protocols are like uh, open to this uh, partitioning attack as well. Yes, yes, sorry, I agree with this. So, so the, the comment is that um, with Byzantine consensus protocols, there is a, I wasn't gonna, maybe I'll, I'll Maybe we can, discuss, uh, or we can discuss with other people offline. So there is a canonical attack against Byzantine consensus protocols um, that does not work against longest chain. And that's one reason why I think people like the longest chain protocol. Um, so sorry, I'm not trying to advocate and say that Byzantine protocols, uh, Byzantine consensus protocols are better because they have finality. I'm just trying to distinguish between the uh, yeah, two, two paradigms. Like this, this is not the right dimension whether the protocol is chain based or uh, Byzantine consensus based. Like I, I pretend Possibly I can construct your longest chain protocol that tolerates partition too, like maybe some partially synchronous longest chain protocol. I think I can do that, it's probably going to be complicated. So it's not a property of what the protocol is like, it's actually a protocol, it's a property of what you assume. Like if the pro if I prove security under the assumption that like, let's say the network has bounded delay and the delay is known to the protocol, you know, typically, I mean, a class of these protocols like they often make use of the synchrony assumption. And when the synchrony assumption is broken, obviously yeah, yeah. all bets are off. So yeah, that's yes. kind of like saying so, if so the network gets partitioned, then you don't get consist consistency at all. Yeah, so, so maybe let me still say, I still think that there are, there are something interesting about these two different approaches. My impression is that the longest chain protocols are not necessarily trying to have finality, and that it is maybe a feature that they don't have this hard finality. And that the the finality is also a weird notion. You can only talk about the probability because even Byzantine consensus has signatures. Also, yes, that's also yes, that's, that's also true. Just maybe yes. the probability is like two to the minus two to the minus forty. But that's all. Yes, know. yes, but that's also true. Longest chain. If you chop off like sufficiently many blocks, yeah. you can get that probability as well. Yeah, I agree. Let me two to the minus forty and ten percent of difference. So yeah. So let me let well, me try to quickly wrap up. Chop off more blocks at the end. Then you can, you can yeah. tell if there's finality if you just let, if you assume there's 100% Byzantine faults. If there's 100% Byzantine faults and blocks can't be reverted, then there's finality. If there's 100% Byzantine faults and blocks can be reverted, then there's not finality. So, okay. Wow, so, so 100% there are some lower bugs. I think you're talking about that, a well, very... Well, consensus failure, which isn't uh, a reversion of blocks. On the standard models, you cannot achieve consensus. I mean, uh, the, no, the problem is also degenerate. It's like 100% Well, you don't have consensus so safety, but there's a question of whether the node actually works. Okay, so, okay, so let me, so I think I'm going to skip the last section too, so Arvind has time. But the main thing I want to point out, I do think, regardless of, so maybe I got the definitions wrong, I do think that these kinds of protocols do have fundamentally different approaches to how they're trying to solve the problem. And I wanted to point out that there are, I think, fundamentally different approaches. Maybe I think of finality as being the main difference, but maybe that's not the right way to think about it. But there's roughly two kinds of um, paradigms for trying to solve this. Um, so the last thing I was going to discuss was um, turn complete cryptocurrencies, but I think I'm already over time. Um, so I'll skip that. You can ask me about it um, offline. I imagine that the panel will probably discuss this a lot too. Um, so anyway, okay, so thanks for listening and maybe we can do qu any questions offline so Arvind can start.